Well, welcome. So uh, once again, we're going to read Schooled by Gordon Corman. Today we're going to do chapter 26. Um, the character who's telling this chapter is Sophie Donnelly. And I wanted to focus on what can you infer. And I gave you a couple sentence starters. I think, whatever it is, because your evidence from the text. I predict, and then whatever it is you're predicting. Because as we read, we want to be thinking deeply about the text. And we've talked a lot about this, and we've talked about being putting yourself in the character's shoes. We've talked about visualizing the story, making a movie in your head. So from what position are you going to infer? Are you going to pretend to be one of the characters down on the ground, invested in the story? Or are you going to be that movie producer looking in from above and thinking about how you're going to shoot the scene? Either way, you have to infer. You have to read between the lines and create that story, that image, and think more deeply about it. So I encourage you to use these sentence starters in your head as I read so that you can think more deeply about Sophie Donnelly's perspective and what it means for the bigger story. So here we go. Tea day at last. My driving test. Things were finally falling into place. Dad had come through with the bracelet. I was an only child again. Life was even looking up on the boyfriend front. For the last couple of days, I'd been on the receiving end of some intense glances from Martin Einfield, a senior on the lacrosse team. Now I just had to pass this test. Dad phoned to wish me luck, going on and on about how proud he was. He talked as if he'd been my mentor and not someone who'd finally showed up to give me a few lessons before blowing town. But it was good to hear his voice. And anyway, I had something to say to him on a previous topic. Thanks for getting the bracelet back to me, the inscription. It was really sweet. There was dead silence on the other end of the line. Dad, are you there? Yeah, Soph, I'm here, the reply came at last. I'm on my cell. And the connection isn't great. What was that about the bracelet? Just thank you. The inscription, I never knew you were so sentimental. Glad your old man can still get the job done, he said smoothly. Listen, Soph, you're breaking up. I can barely hear you. Good luck on the test. Knock him dead. The line went silent. I hung up frowning. The connection hadn't seemed so terrible to me. Even more confusing was his reaction to my thank you for the bracelet. For a moment there, I could have sworn he didn't have the faintest idea what I was talking about. My mother bustled in. Ready to go? Mother, do you think Dad could have already forgotten about sending back the engraved bangle? She gave me that sympathetic social worker look that she normally reserved for her loser clients like Cap Anderson. Your father loves you and he always has the best of intentions. Ask a simple question get a load of touchy-feely psychobabble in return. So, I should take that as a yes? Honey, this is such a big day for you. Why would you dwell on something that's only going to make you unhappy? Whatever. The waiting room at the DMV was decorated with large mounted photos of multi-vehicle pileups, real subtle. Truth be told, I was scared to death. When the examiner got into the car, I honestly thought I might lose my lunch. Make a left out of the parking lot, he instructed. It was a wet day, not pouring rain, but misty. That spooked me too. Turning the wheel, working the pedals, these things should have been second nature. Today, they seemed awkward and complicated. Like I was diffusing a bomb, one wrong move and boom. To calm my nerves, I tried to replace the instructor with a mental image of dad in the passenger seat. Yet, for some reason, the imaginary companion my brain conjured up was not my father, but Cap. I shook my head to reboot, but he was still there. The freakazoid was coming with me on the most important test of my life. And why did the examiner have to take me down such a narrow street? There were parked cars on both sides with very little road between them. Oh no. I was on the edge of panic when a familiar voice sounded inside my skull. If the front gets through, the rest will drag. Gritting my teeth, I aimed the hood into the tight passage and held on for dear life. It was all I could do to keep from cheering as the Saturn threaded the needle. Thanks, Cap, 
It was a good thing Rain drove a taxi before devoting her life to terrorizing my mother. I love that statement. Turn onto the interstate, the examiner ordered. I took it slow, merging onto the highway. As we picked up speed, droplets of water began running down the windshield. I set the wipers on intermittent, feeling a little more confident. Still, my mind kept returning to the phone conversation with Dad. Believe me, I knew the man was a flake. But how could he forget about the bracelet? He didn't just give it to me. He presented it, took it away, had it engraved, and then brought it to the post office to mail. Anything with that many steps would stick in your mind, wouldn't it? Exit here and head east on Fillmore. I obsessed on the subject until the bangle on my wrist felt like an iron shackle from some medieval dungeon. How I managed to operate the car was a total mystery. I was completely distracted, and the more I twisted the facts, the more they pointed to a single inescapable conclusion. Dad didn't forget about the engraved bracelet. He never sent it to me in the first place. It must have been Mother. That wasn't her style, though. Not that she wanted me to be miserable, but the one thing she always said about her job was, I can't let these kids live in a fantasy land. She was always nagging people to face reality, even me, especially me. When the subject was my father, it made no sense that she'd go through an elaborate ruse to trick me into believing that he'd followed through on his promise. But if not her, then who? And I just need you to parallel park between these orange cones, the examiner was saying. Run the defogger a minute to make sure you can see out the back. I reached for the button and missed. Instead, my finger hit the on switch for the radio. Music filled the car, the Beatles singing the chorus of All You Need Is Love. Anyone who lived through the 60s will remember this old classic, came the DJ's voice as the song began its slow fade. And suddenly, there were tears streaming down my face. The examiner was appalled. There's no need to cry, miss. It's no big deal. You just hit the wrong button. I won't take any... Take off any points for that. No, it's not that, I managed still blubbering, but how could I ever explain it? The radio, the song, the engraved bangle wasn't from mom or dad. All you need is love. There was only one person who could have come up with that inscription, Cap. I crunched all four cones. The examiner passed me anyway. I think he just felt sorry for me. At that point, I was so broken up, I don't think I would have noticed if the car had burst into flames. Cap had bought the bracelet and had it engraved just so I wouldn't feel bad about Dad blowing me off. He got absolutely nothing in return. He wasn't my boyfriend. He wasn't even my friend. He couldn't expect so much as a thank you since the gift was supposed to be from someone else. He did this for no other reason than to make me happy. When I got back to the waiting room, Mother took one look at my red eyes and ashen complexion and assumed the worst. Never mind, honey. You'll take the test again. I lashed out at her. Get a clue, Mother. I have to go pick up my license. She was astonished. Then why are you crying? Why? Because I had never said a civil word to Capricorn Anderson. From the day he'd first set foot in our house, I declared war on the poor kid. I'd called him freakazoid, poured water on him, and never missed a chance to point out what a loser he was. And he'd responded by doing the most wonderful thing anyone had ever done for me. Just say and think about that for a minute. I clamped my jaw shut. The last thing I wanted was to let this slip in front of my mother. I felt horrible enough as it was. I couldn't even enjoy the moment of being a licensed driver almost as if it was unfair for something good to happen to a rotten person like me. I think this is like um, a tough question, turning point, where she's examining her own reality. And the worst part was it was too late for me ever to make it up to Cap. He was gone, S sucked back into 1967. His last chance at having a life was shot. I thought back to myself in eighth grade, all the good times still to come, but not for him. He was buried in his ponchos and peace signs. Tomorrow was Halloween. Those Halloween dances were the best thing about middle school. The poor guy got hauled off to the freak farm before he even had a chance to party, get wild, actually dance with a girl. And there was nothing 
anybody could do about it. Unless... All right, boys and girls, we'll have to see what happens in Chapter 27. I look forward to your reading and jotting in your own books. Bye.